guys for that delay. Um, but I hope you guys all had time to think, and you were probably talking about my lecture. That's what I was <laughs> overhearing. <laughs> How great it was or something. That's what I was overhearing. Um, so anyway, we get back to the point where we're discussing the fact that mortality is significantly decreased based on the amount of balanced solutions that are given. Now, a similar study was then done um, beginning of this year by a Dr. Shaw, who did a fairly similar um, study looking at a large amount of patients with saline versus balanced solutions. Um, and he found that there was a pretty similar mortality um, uh, difference with patients that have uh, balanced solutions having a mort uh, mortality of one percent versus those with unbalanced solutions having mortality closer to three. So pretty similar in difference uh, or in uh, the, the difference of percentage of, of mortality. What we also saw during this study was that there was a, a odds ratio were just generally in favor of using balanced solutions for multiple areas of uh, organ failure and organ injury, particularly looking at um, heart failure and urinary failure. So as I mentioned before, many of these studies that have been completed um, have looked at uh, various strategies of balanced versus unbalanced solution. And what it really comes down to, um, and what it seems that it comes down to, is this anion that's present in normal saline chloride. There's many, many claims that have been made against hyperchloremia. Um, not, people don't like it as an anion, and there's, there's a lot of studies in the past 10 years that have really just kind of defamed this, this little electrolyte running around our body. Um, there's a lot of things that are associated with hyperchloremia, metabolic acidosis, increased inflammatory cytokines. We have um, a propensity for renal vasoconstriction in the setting of hyperchloremia, as well as um, increase in interstitial edema and the possible development of coagulopathy associated with hyperchloremia. So we're going to kind of delve into these different claims about hyperchloremia and see um, what has been found. So I combined metabolic acidosis and this inflammatory cytokine as kind of one um, major insult because they seem to correspond with each other in the setting of hyperchloremia. Um, in the delivery of normal saline, um, <clears throat> we develop an acidosis in our bloodstream, a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And there's different theories as to what is really is this really bad or is this, um, you know, potentially deleterious or is this just something that we can expect as a normal side effect and move on from that? Um, when we're talking about the strong ion difference, we have to consider what our body is wanting to be at a strong anion or a strong ion difference of zero. So we want an equal number of cations and anions in our bloodstream to bathe our plasma to allow them to work as functionally as they can. And when we change that ion difference, it changes the way that our cells are able to communicate as well as to um, function. There's been many animal studies that have correlated increasing hyperchloremia and the presence of acidosis with worsening hemodynamic profiles and inflammations. This one particular was done in rats, but there's one that has been done in dogs, a couple others that have been done in rats and pigs as well. And what they did was they took this rat and they made um, him relatively hypovolemic. Um, and then they started replacing that volume with a chloride solution versus um, what they call their control, which is a balanced solution of lactated ringers. Um, so as you can see, with, over time, they looked at four hours and then eight hours after initiating this volume resuscitation, the pH appropriately trends downward. Their goal in this situation was to provide enough chloride um, in one group to put the patient at a base excess of 5 to 10, and, or put the rat at a base excess of 5 to 10, and then in another group to put them at a base excess of 10 to 15. So you have three groups, your control, your base excess of 5 to 10, and your base excess of 10 to 15 to see does this chloride really have an effect on what's going to be happening with this rat. Um, what they saw is that the pH appropriately trended downward, because now you have this, um, this uh, base excess. And um, <clears throat> the lactate remained the same. The blood pressure remained the same. But the inflammatory markers increased significantly. So over time, with increasing acidemia, the rats developed increases in IL-6, IL-10, and TNF-alpha. 
This has been shown to be true in um, many animal studies. This hasn't been replicated in humans, and I'm not sure if that's just due to a lack of somebody's desire um, or because generally we're already very high with these inflammatory cytokines when we're treating patients with large volume resuscitation. But these uh, presence of chloride has been now associated with significant inflammatory cytokine markers. Renal vasoconstriction is another thing that has really been um, a uh, offense that hyperchloremia has um, made towards our kidneys and towards resuscitation in general. Um, this is kind of a, a little bit of a difficult graphic to read, um, but basically what it's showing is that the chloride um, when it goes into the artery or the arteriole um, and through the kidney, um, gets a, it, we're not getting a significant amount of chloride reabsorption in the proximal tubule, tubule, but when we go through the loop of Henle, we're getting this increase. Um, the, the loop of Henle is seeing more chloride, um, and in response, the macula densa is now getting a chloride lo load. When this happens, that, that membrane depolarizes and then the body releases adenosine and we begin to constrict the afferent arterioles and this ideally is decreasing the renal blood flow. So many people have said um, that physiologically what we're seeing is in the presence of hyper, hyperchloremia, you're getting afferent arteriole um, constriction and this is overall decreasing the GFR of the patients that you have. Now is this true? Um, in vivo. They did a, another study again with rats um, to see what's happening when these patients are hyper, when these rats are hyperchloremic, when we're giving them um, profound hyperchloremia. Another situation that they created these rat models of shock and gave them a hyperchloremic um, solution comparing it to a balanced solution and found that clearly the, the, the rats were more profoundly acidemic and hyperchloremic after resuscitation with normal saline. Um, but then they looked at the renal blood flow of these rats and saw that with this hyperchloremia came a decreased GFR and a very low cre a lower creatinine clearance as compared to those resuscitated with um, uh, Ringer's acetate, or even uh, the head of starch mixed with Ringer's acetate, which is interesting because we, we've had some associations with head of starch being not so good for the kidneys. So what it's showing is that the presence of hyperchloremia in these patients, or in these rats rather, is leading to a decreased renal blood flow. So they, Chowdhury wanted to see, does this work in humans? So if I'm seeing this in rats, I'm assuming that it's working in humans. Everybody's saying that chloride solutions are bad for patients. Is this really bad for patients? So he took healthy human subjects. Um, there's some young guys that decided that they were okay getting two liters of fluid uh, instilled. And so they had a group of normal saline patients versus a group of plasmolite patients. And he gave them just a two liter bolus and looked under MRI to see what the renal blood flow was like to their kidneys. During um, the uh, MRI, what they noticed was that there was a significant change in the renal artery velocity. So the um, top graphic is the plasmolite, the bottom graphic is the normal saline, and then again here, the renal cortical perfusion, top graphic is the um, plasmolite and the bottom graphic is the normal saline. So during this time of resuscitation, the normal saline decreased the flow to the kidneys and decreased the cortical perfusion of the kidneys by a factor of 9 to 10%. Now the question is, is this clinically significant? I don't know. Um, and I don't think that question has been answered for us. However, it was tried to be answered um, by uh, Dr. Yunos, who looked at chloride liberal versus chloride restricted fluids. And this is probably one of the studies that most of you have read or, or know, because it was very famous, came out in um, JAMA in 2012. And he looked at um, patients with uh, chloride liberal versus chloride restricted solutions. What they did was they had a six month period at their institution where they kind of just watched people and let them resuscitate patients with whatever fluid they wanted to resuscitate patients with, which was primarily normal saline. They allowed for a six month washout period and then the following six months they said, you know, we're going to do balanced solutions here for resuscitation. So during the control period, which was the 
um, normal saline period, um, they found that 6.3% of the patients that were that were um, receiving this resuscitation had kidney injury, and about 10% of those patients ended up requiring renal replacement therapy. Um, once they instituted uh, balanced solutions, there was 3% of patients that re that developed renal injury, and um, about 6.5% of patients who actually ended up requiring renal replacement therapy. And, you know, the question becomes, I think it's a little bit difficult to say, you know, these patients had acute kidney injury in the setting of their hypovolemia or septic shock, and was it just because they weren't having that great of urine output because of this decreased GFR that they ended up on renal replacement therapy? I don't think we can make that inference yet, but it is something that we need to be aware of and to consider. So I think what we do know is that there's a lot of there's a lot of hate towards chloride, and I don't think that it's misplaced at this point in time. Um, what we see is that chloride causes a significant hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis in our patients. Um, there's been some presumed uh, thought that this can be damaging to the endothelial glycocalyx that helps regulate our hydrostatic and oncotic pressures. We've seen that it's associated with a decreasing renal perfusion as well as uh, increasing the actual amount of edema in the kidney itself. Um, we've noted gastrointestinal edema with uh, presence of hyperchloremic solution, as well as a possible trend towards coagulopathy, as well as increased need for pressors, particularly in patients that are undergoing operations. Um, there's been studies, Dr. Yassian has shown a study, as well as a couple other that have just associated chloride with worsening all-cause mortality in the setting of critically ill patients. And so I don't think this is something that we can yet ignore, but I don't think we can say it's necessarily a causality. I think we have to make a strong association with the presence of hyperchloremia and these critical illness. The interesting thing is that we're not the first people or this group of, you know, physicians, the era of critical care docs or anesthesiologists in 2000, you know, 10 to 15 when all these studies have really been coming out. This is this is old news. Um, I'm going to read you something. I have to grab it from here. Let's see if we take it out of this room. Okay. And you can read it yourself too. Um, but this is, and I wish I could read it in a British accent just because it's funny. Um, this is a letter um, that was written uh, it was a letter to the editor for the Journal of um, American or the, the of JAMA in 1911. Dr. Evans, who was like aware of all of these patients that were being resuscitated with um, this new salt solution that was now becoming ever present, said, "It's my desire to call attention briefly to some of these conditions and to sound a note of warning against the thoughtless and indiscriminate use of this remedy, meaning sodium chloride solution. The apparent harmlessness of sodium chloride, a salt." which forms such an important part of the fluids of the body, the fact that this salt is found so largely in practically all of our foodstuffs, the idea altogether that too prevalent, judging from what we see in everyday clinical experience, that there's practically no limitation to the functional capacity of the glomeruli of the kidneys to excrete water, all of these factors have probably been responsible for a great deal of indiscrimination in its use. One cannot fail to be impressed with the danger of one such procedure if they observe the utter recklessness with salt solution is frequently uh, prescribed. And it just goes on and on <laughs> um, about how concerned this guy is for the use of hyperchloremic solutions. And this was a hundred years ago. Um, and I think that he has a really good idea. He ends his statement with, I would therefore urge a more discriminating use of this therapeutic measure restricted to those conditions and whether in which either quantitative or qualitative changes in the blood plasma present logical indications for its application. And then only after that has been satisfactorily demonstrated that circulatory or renal conditions do not coexist. So I agree with this guy, um, <laughs> and uh, I think that most of us will end up agreeing with him shortly. The only one thing I wanted to say is, you know, we talk about normal saline, and I kind of was hating on it throughout the day today, but there are times when it is useful. Um, there were studies looking, w the, some of the studies that have looked at normal saline compared to balanced solutions 
um, did find one particular subgroup of patients that did not benefit from the use of balanced solutions, and it was that group of patients that suffered from traumatic brain injury or cerebral edema. Um, and they actually showed worsening cerebral water content, increasing intracranial pressure in the setting of the use of lactated ringers. So despite the fact that normal saline was my nemesis today. I also think that there, it, it's use, it can be useful. And so just like I was saying with fluids or drugs, what's your indication for these fluids as drugs? And how can we best use these fluids that we have to profit change in our patients? So in summary, there are no consensus guidelines right now that state that balanced solutions are preferred over normal saline. However, I think current evidence would suggest that hyperchloremia may be associated with worsening outcomes, and so avoiding this in patients would be ideal. Um, consider the use of chloride-restricted IV fluids in patients that need larger volume resuscitation, because this is where you see hyperchloremia begin to, to have a big role. And then consider in your patients that have uh, traumatic brain injuries or other increased um, risk of ICP that maybe you can find a good useful role for normal saline in that setting. Thank you for bearing with me and my technical difficulties today. <laughs> Any questions? The rise in inflammatory markers. Mm -hmm. The graph that you showed was just temporary. Mm -hmm. 